Good morning everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Layla and this is where we talk about personal, educational, and professional development. Although we are a small YouTube community right now, I do know from my YouTube analytics that there are people from all over the world watching this channel and today's video has been highly, highly requested by a lot of my international friends and today's video is going to be about immigration, visas, and everything that relates to coming into the United States and potentially becoming a permanent resident here. For today's video, I have collaborated with attorney Jafarov. He has been in the United States for a very long time, has a lot of experience. He has a very impressive track record as an attorney, and I am so excited to introduce you guys to him. And hopefully when you come here into the United States in the future, you can work with him to get your processes started and to obtain your permanent residence. So with that further ado, we're going to get started with the video and we are going to ask him some of the frequently asked questions that I have been getting on Instagram. Good morning, Attorney Jafarov. I am very, very happy to see you on here today. I'm very excited to introduce you to my international audience. And I think that you're going to be a great resource of inspiration for my international viewers. Before we get into the frequently asked questions, I'd like you to introduce yourself so that my audience can also get to know you better. Thanks for the invite. So I'm delighted for the results of the first interview. It seems we get a lot of um, responses, reactions from people. Just to introduce myself briefly, I was born in Azerbaijan, but I grew up in Turkey since um, 1992. And, and I studied my high school and university in Turkey. So I know that some of your the audience members, they ask questions why he's using a lot of Turkish words. Because when I was 15 years old, I moved to Turkey. So I grew up over there, I studied there. It's, it's natural, I guess, also the, the fact that the language is very close. We sometimes use Turkish words. So I studied in Turkey, high school, university, and I did my master's. I started my PhD, then moved to U.S. in 2003. Um, but I came to U.S. first time in 2000. And um, <clears throat> since then, I've been living in U.S. since 2003 on a green card. And myself, I came here um, on a DV lottery visa and green card. And in 2004, actually, I started University of Connecticut. It's in the state of Connecticut. So I studied um, insurance law, master's program. I obtained my degree. And after obtaining degree, I took bar exam in New York. And um, since 2010, I've been practicing immigration law. Um, since 2010, I was also working actually for a company. We did, we did um, financial and insurance compliance. We, so we served all, um, I would say, most of the insurance and financial institutions, insurance companies and financial institutions in the United States. Um, we, we did find the, you know, what we call compliance intelligence, just providing them information about upcoming changes and uh, advising them how to position and how to handle those changes. Um, so starting from 2016, I do full-time immigration. It's a full-blown practice um, and I'm independent and resigned my from, from previous position. Um, we started with a small law firm and I'm glad to tell you that right now we are kind of, you know, mid-sized law firm and we, we have 10 people working and three licensed attorneys. And we have one licensed attorney in California, one in Massachusetts, one in New York. Um, but since immigration is federal, so many people don't know that, we can serve our clientele uh, throughout the country and the world. So if you have questions, let's say you live in Florida, it doesn't matter, you can still contact us and we'll still be, be, be able to help. Um, we had offices in um, you know, uh, Florida and also in Boston. And as I said, primary practice is immigration, but we also help people with international business needs. For example, if you have a franchise that you would like to obtain from the United States and take to Azerbaijan or Poland or Germany, that's what we do. And um, we also basically do general immigration practice, which means that we cover all areas of immigration. Many immigration law firms, they usually handle, let's say, removal defense. They do only, you know, um, transactional, what they call it transactional. So they're not really familiar with the court process, but they just file papers. We do both. We have lawyers in our law firm. They do uh, defensive removal defense. And we have people, they just help large and mid-sized companies to obtain employment visas for their um, employees. So that's the basic 
quickly summary of our practice and then my, about myself. Thank you very much for introducing yourself. And I'd like to jump on to our first frequently asked question, and it's about the student visa. A lot of the viewers that I have as part of my community are very interested in the ways of obtaining a student visa. The question is, how do you obtain a student visa? Should you start the process of obtaining a student visa in your home country, or can you do that after coming here into the United States? And what are some of the important details that the students must know before they get started on this process? Well, I understand the reason and rationale behind of this question because most of probably people come to this country for education and then they stay in this country or so they continue their lives in this country and which happened, this is the history of immigration, you know, Chinese and, and Europeans, Irish and Germans, they came to this country, most of them you know, to study and they stayed and um, they established their businesses and everything. So, um, you know, I guess your question is basically for people who are in overseas physically and they, they, they want to understand when you get visa and, and you know, what, what's the time when you have visa that which would enable to enter the country. So the process generally for F1 visas, you know, you apply to universities. The first you have to get acceptance. And once you have acceptance um, and they will issue a document called I-20, with I-20 I basically allows you to certify that you meet the requirements to be a student in, in a specific university, but you still have to go through a consular process to obtain your visa. So the visa is issued by the U.S. embassies and overseas. Many people don't understand. My clients get sometimes too excited. They call me, they say, I have my visa. And, and the visa, what they call is the, just the, the paper from the university. Um, so the, the university, when they issue acceptance, it doesn't guarantee that you will have your visa. It's just a, a paper saying that you can come and study. And and then you have to go to US Embassy and convince them that you come to United States for a sole purpose of obtaining education. And once you have it, you will go back. Um, the intent is going back. So don't forget that. So many people ask me questions, you know, I want to come there and stay. I want to come on a fun visa. So first of all, if you have intent to come and stay, you should not be using F1. Of course, people's intent can change. Many people don't understand that. So you can enter with intent to study and return, but you come, you come here and you find a job offer opportunities and you stay. So um, I want to keep this question answer short because you might have some follow-up questions and I will expand from that. But the, the visa issued by the US embassies and even that visa that you have in your stamp says F1, it's not a really admission. Admission is a different thing. Admission you obtain at the time of entrance in the airport. So many people also don't understand that the stamp you have in your passport doesn't guarantee that you're going to enter the United States. So you might be questioned in the airport and they are not bound by the previous decision of the US Embassy and they might deny your uh, entrance. So you got to be ready and understand the whole process. As I say, immigration is complex. Um, I have read somewhere, I believe immigration is the second most difficult uh, the, the, the practice area for, for attorneys. I mean, to be honest, Frank, I have a lot of um, colleagues and friends. When I tell them that I practice immigration, they're like, oh my God, how you do that? So to them, it's like extremely difficult because federal law, but you have to know sometimes state law, sometimes you have to know international law, and the federal laws are ever changing and there are thousands of regulations. So what I'm trying to say that when you enter the country, you also have to be careful with the admission issue and got to make sure that you gave them right responses and you don't make mistakes. You don't tell them that you're going to start working for Microsoft soon. <laughs> That's the intent or you're going to get married or something. So, of course, you shouldn't have that intent. If you have intent, you hide it. That's also illegal. So. Um, a lot of things to know. Thank you very much for your answer. And I also wanted to clarify another part of this question, and that is going to be about change of intent. Say so you come here into the United States as a tourist, and then you do change your intention after getting here, and you want to stay here and continue studying. How does that affect you as a foreign national, how does that affect your immigration processes here? Well, you're asking a very good question. I mean, you really deserve a compliment <laughs> because because these are legal questions, because these are the questions that people discuss and talk and write articles. It's not a Facebook question. It's it's not a, you know, it's really deep questions. And, and respond to that, um, just to respect how high level question is, I'm going to try to answer it, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to cover everything. So basically, the intent is everything, you're right. So when you come here, 
I have seen cases actually, people come to United States, they change their successful, they change their visa from B2 to F1. And when they go back to their own countries, uh, they go to the Philippines, the embassy in Philippines, they deny their visa saying that at the time of going to the United States, you told me that you're going there for two weeks vacation, but you really lied to me, even though you did everything legal, it seems you lied to me, you, you, you actually hid your intention. So intention is a very, it's a devil, like it's everywhere. You gotta, you gotta be very careful with that, right? Um, so yes, I mean, I really, because it's gonna depend on the case, I cannot really give you pinpoint response, but really gotta be extremely careful with that. The intent, uh, that's what I'm saying. Like when you come here, I don't know, um, if you come for two weeks course and change it, of course they're gonna know that you really had intent to stay for a long time. If you're gonna do that, don't, if possible, just come here on an F1 visa, because right now, honestly, it's it's much easier to obtain F1 visas. Um, so that's one thing. But as I said, the intent is gonna be really up to the officer to make that decision. It's not really up to me, but I can advise and tell you that where you're gonna have a problem. And that's gonna depend on the individual case. We have to sit down and, and talk so I can tell you that where are the issues, where are the problems. There is a, even a fund. If you come in on a fund and you go back, um, you still might issue a problem. They will tell you that you went there for two month short period. And it seems that you right now enrolled in a PhD program. So what I'm trying to say that the intent problem is always there, the line, the information. So that's the reason we are saying that, I mean, I don't want to really uh, talk about someone else's business, but there are so many, um, you know, the visa prep companies in overseas, they do a lot of things that, that are wrong. For example, they give wrong information. So I would say that's the reason I keep saying that like people should work with professional because, you know, the, the visa obtaining, the visa prep companies, they just only thing they, they think for you is that you go to United States. And once you go to United States, their job is done. They're not attorneys. You will never follow up with them. You will always be thankful to them because they sent you to America and they're going to advertise saying that we sent many people to America. But but then issues that the information you provided on the forums, when you change your stats, going to haunt you. When you obtain adjustments, going to haunt you. Your entire life is going to be there. So people got to understand that it's, 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 this is this, in the United States, nothing is, is lost. Everything is stored in a database. I wish I could show my clients that, you know, FBI background check data. It comes 300 pages that every country you visited, every information we obtained this information. And I go through the, the file, you know, we recently found out that actually someone didn't even know that he was a citizen of Afghanistan, for example. <laughs> so just give an example. I mean, this, you know, of course the information is you don't have to know all of that stuff, but I'm just trying to say that. Um, it is really much larger than what people think. Of course, it was the Trump administration made it even more difficult because they just start pulling these cards and, and using it against people. So the next administration might be a little bit more, um, you know, nicer. I would say a little bit nicer. Um, but um, you know, these are the things that these are the laws. And, and if the officer is, you know, you don't forget it doesn't matter whoever comes as a president. The, the officer is still there, right? They didn't change all the officers. So they will still apply the same law sometimes. It's it's law abiding country and manage you know, there's a legal system so so they always have to take caution and use everything in the right way to make sure that they have no surprises, no no problems. Thank you very much for your answer. And my next question would be, once you get here into the United States as a foreign national with an F1 visa, what are some of the additional visas that you can obtain to be able to work as a student in the United States during and after your studies? When you start studying, once you have that mission, you enter the country, and most of the universities, they allow you, not most, most, I would say some of the universities, they would allow you to work on campus. So you work part time, I believe less than 20 hours, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, uh, people shouldn't really, you know, really hang on to that idea of coming here and working on campus because on campus, you won't be able to survive by 20 hours working in a, in a cafeteria or something. So, um, you know, it's just a good experience to learn maybe language, um, be in the environment, I don't know, be around professors and, uh, and, the, and the students, but it's not going to really help you much. So, um, but you can obtain um, the work visas, what they call CPT and OPT. Uh, CPT is, is basically as your education continues, you do parallel kind of learning internship. Uh, you can do it outside, you can do full-time. 
Um, there are rules. I'm not going to get into detail because there are tons of rules. But if you do CPT full time, sometimes you lose your opportunity to do OPT. OPT is after the graduation. Uh, is after the graduation they give you one year full time to work, and um, so you can obtain that CPT based on also your program. It's not every program provides CPT, so you should talk to your university maybe before, before you come and ask them, you know, what are the employment opportunities? Are they providing full-time, part-time? Uh, how many years? How long? So they should have those questions uh, for the university admission, uh, the university admission office. And, uh, but most of the universities, I'm talking about the degree programs. I'm not talking about the ESLs, the, the language courses. If you come here for a degree program, you will have one year post completion after the completion to be able to work and, and study. And that's going to give you only one year, but you have to really um, get ready for it. It's if you want to stay and work, you have to focus on H1B and different type of visas, because let's say if you graduate in May, they will give you one year till the next May, but the H1B season starts in April on April 1st. Right. So you should start basically prepping your application and talking to your um, employer to make sure that they, they, got, they want to sponsor you because there's a cost involved and it's work involved, HR work, so the, the employer also has to be um, on the same page with you. So, you, you know, when you transition from OP2, OPT to H1B, um, you know, because you're, most of the OPTs, they expire in May and June. So many people also worry about how we're going to, because you cannot start working on H1B till October 1st. So many people worry and they have valid questions saying that how I'm going to manage how I'm going to keep my status between, let's say, June or May to August, October 1st, I'm sorry. And there's a specific specific rule, they call it step gap, gap rule, that, you know, um, extends people's status till October 1st, OPT status. So basically, if you are selected in H1B process, you can, can, you can continue to work um, till October 1st and keep your OPT. Till the time H1B starts, so there's there are rules that will help you. But as I said, there are so many rules. I don't want to. When I when I respond questions, one of the the most difficult things I have ever have is that how much information is is good information because um, you know I saw from the previous comments. I don't read all of them. Sometimes when I have time, I read the comments. But some of the comments, people, you know, it's it's weird. They commented saying that uh, attorney gives too much information. You know, it, it gives very broad information, but this information, people pay money to get this information. I mean, people should be appreciative that they're getting it because short information doesn't provide you any information and really doesn't get you in a place, you know. Um, so, as I said, but the reason I was saying that there are so many rules, I mean, I can expand and speak hours and hours, but that's the reason people should do consultation and talk to professionals before they start. There are so many things to know, so we wouldn't be able to cover in one hour. Thank you very much for your answer. And my next question may sound a little bit broad, but it's a frequently asked question and it's about H-1B visas. How likely are you as a foreign national to be able to obtain an H-1B visa? What are some of the most popular ways of obtaining an H-1B here in the United States as a foreign national? I would like to just start saying that H-1B is, is one of the areas that it's many people don't explore, many people don't know nothing or they're afraid to even try, even the law firms in the United States. I think I've mentioned in my previous interview, I believe I did. So one of my clients came to me and he was planning to, his company was uh, planning to sponsor him and do H-1B in the United States from F1 to H-1B. And, you know, they talked to a law firm, it's a large law firm, and they said that, well, H-1B is, is for large law firms like Microsoft, IBM, and other companies like Apple. It's not like, you you know, you're a small company, you can really sponsor them. That's absolutely false. Uh, there is no such thing. Um, the only thing in the law, it says ability to pay. So basically the company have to prove that they have a power to pay your salary. That's the only requirement. It doesn't say how many employees, it doesn't say when you started. Last year, it's just, just basically hard evidence I wanna present to my, my uh, your audience that last year we started one company. The company started literally in, 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 in February, 2020. And in March, we registered the company. In April, we applied for H-1B and it was approved. And there was no employee of the company. It was the first employee of the company, just started. We established the company. So what I'm trying to say that 
there are so many successful Azerbaijani, Turkish, German, uh, any country, Russian businesses in the United States, right? So these businesses, they can sponsor and bring people from overseas. And it is legal. There is nothing wrong with it. So right now, in terms of H-1B issuance, there's a um, the executive order actually still in power. It's not canceled. Trump's before, right before he left office, he issued one on the 30th, I believe, the last day, last night, his gift to us. So we have to deal with that crap. So he left and then um, the executive order is still valid till the end of March uh, this year, 2021. We expect uh, probably even today, the president is going to rescind and cancel and, and, and send it away. But right now people can't enter on H1B till the March. Uh, after March, it's going to probably go back to normal. I encourage the companies here and, and the employees to look for jobs and talk to people. You know, many people have interest, but they just don't know. There are, there's a lot of false information. For example, in, in uh, I, I believe in September or October, the Department of Labor, they increased the salaries for, you know, for H-1B applicants. They really increased significantly. For example, I remember the salaries that used to be 85,000 became 130,000. So it's a lot of increase. Uh, but it was cancelled, so now it's back to normal. It's a lower salary still, and and the right now only one issue we have actually this year we have to deal with that. But they will probably also cancel it. They are going to prioritize higher wages. For example, let's say for the same position, software engineer, you hire me, and you hire hire Jack, and Jack makes ninety thousand, I make eighty thousand. Probably they're going to issue his visa first before they get to my visa. So. But we also expect this to be um, repealed and cancelled and sent away. So my thing is that people should really research H-1Bs, talk to employers and try to get sponsorship, regardless from overseas or from here. If from overseas, they will have to wait till the end of March, at least for now. Uh, from here, they don't have to wait anything. They can just do it. But there is a catch to that. It's only once in a year. So if you want to do it this year, we already received like probably in the last two weeks, a lot of requests. We do for small and large companies, solar companies, and we do a lot of software engineers in Boston and around the country. Um, so they should be contacting attorneys as soon as possible because we have to register the company with the labor department. We have to get certifications. It takes time and they're slow. So I would say make a deadline for yourself if you're going to do that before March 100% contact your attorney. Thank you very much for your answer. And moving on to my next question, I'd like to talk a little bit about visas for startup founders. How likely are you as a startup founder uh, to get a visa into the United States and how does that process work? And what are some ways of making that goal achievable? Startups, um, I mean, you know, most of the people with startups, they get visa type called E2 visas. Um, and in order to be, a, to be able to apply for this, type of visa your country of citizenship country of origin has to be uh, you know uh, you know a member of the treaty that the u.s signed with many countries so first you have to go online and you know if, if you just type into google called e2 treaty countries you will have the list of the countries so you gotta go there and check to see if your country is a member um signed to that agreement um so once you have that, um, if you're on a tourist visa in this country, let's say you come to visit the United States, just like you said, when you started, when we started, after three months, you, you, you know, you found a business opportunity. I don't know, your friend told you that, you know, why are you going back? Let's do this business. And you want to do that, really, and which happens all the time. So if you're going to do that, there is a 90 days rule. Basically, you should not be starting, a, you know, a, submitting an application, change of status within the first 90 days. Uh, first 90 days is always seen as a sign of fraud, something going on because you came in with the intent to stay. Um, that's the interpretation. Um, you know, you can still overcome that, you know, if you really have, you know, I don't know, reason. Let's say, just give an example, I don't know. You have crazy offer that you cannot pass. The company gives you 10 days deadline saying that, you know, you're going to be a partner with Microsoft and you have 10 days to say yes or no. And if yes, you're going to do this. Just, just trying the, you know, example there. So if those kind of exceptions you have, you can still overcome that nine, let's say you can submit application within 45 days. But I usually suggest don't even get into that because it's just you're risking a lot of stuff and it's probably going to fail in your argument. So 90 days, you start the status change in the United States. 
Um, I mean, the biggest problem right now is the money problem because you have to bring money from overseas. That's the biggest problem because for E2 visas, actually, many people also don't know you don't even need a business background. You don't even need experience. You don't need nothing. Like, you know, you, I don't know, you're a doctor, you can start a computer business in the United States. You can do anything you want to do. Of course, if you have a background, it's going to help. It's, it's great. Um, but you don't have to have a past experience. You don't have to have a past business. And you just need to bring money, which is clean. When I say clean, it's legit. It's not drug money. It's not bribery. It's not criminal money. So it's a clean money that comes to the United States. So in many countries in today's world, the transfers are very difficult because of the, the economic crisis in the world. But we need the trail of the money. The U.S. government wants the trail of the money. Let's say my family wants to send me money and I want to start business in the United States. I have to be able to show that where that my, my family got that money from. Let's say 100,000, they sold house. Then they deposit money into a bank account and it was transferred to the United States. You cannot bring that money in your pocket. 10 people come in here, every, people, every person 10,000 10, in their pocket. That wouldn't work. So um, the trail of the money, but the success in terms of your re responding to your question, I mean, I, I can proudly say that I have never had E2 visa denied. So, you know, if, if you just follow the process, work with attorney, attorney to prove the source of the funds, make sure that you work very carefully, you don't make mistakes over there, because even if you have a good money, it's your money, you can't make a mistake. People do mistakes, like they, I don't know, they send someone else money in Florida and Florida sends to Arizona, they lose the trail and it becomes hard to prove why it's been done that way. Um, so, but that's the, um, so it, it's a good way to explore. And as I said, the, the, in terms of amount, it's not a lot of money required. And you can even, even actually have a, a loan, secure loan agreement, and you don't even have to bring that money from overseas. You can't even do that. But there's, there are procedures that people have to know. And that's where we come and help people to explain how we do that. And my last question to you would be about some of the popular ways to obtain a green card here in the U.S. as a foreign national. Well, there are so many ways um, you can obtain green cards. I mean, I really don't even know where to start from. So I'm going to start with the easiest one, right? The easiest one is always getting married. You know, uh, this is not because I'm saying it. Everyone says it. I have received many when I was uh, 10 years ago, was training. People would ask experienced attorneys and everyone would give the same response saying that just fall in love and get married. So marriage is, is saves the world, right? It's, it's a very um, easy process because you get your green card uh, much faster than many other ways. It's, it's much easier uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the, you know, their chance of getting it. But of course, there a lot of documentation goes into it and a lot of forums. Um, but also the best part of it that you get your temporary work permission and travel document within three to five months and you're able to travel back to your country while waiting for a green card, even before you had your green card. And if you stay two years married before you apply for green card, you get 10 years green card. It's permanent. It's for forever. And also it makes your citizen faster than other ways, like two years, now a month, you, you obtain citizenship. But you can also do through employment, which which are H-1B. H-1B takes you to green card process. But there are other visa types that many people don't know. Those are EB-2s and like EB-2 National Interest Waiver, many people don't know. I have updated our website, I believe, a few days back, um, maybe a month back, about a Brazil Brazilian national that we obtained uh, national interest waiver uh, that's called EB2 category um, but this is many people know national interest waiver for uh, academicians research people uh, research and development RD people the, the person we obtained this national interest waiver for is a home remodeler so it's in the business small business home remodeling business so many people don't even know that they don't even explore that before he came to us it's a true story you can contact the client his information is that he talked to many different companies and they told him that's impossible it's not gonna happen don't even try and his l1 visa he had it was denied but he contacted us we filed an application and we obtained his green card after 10 years in us changing from visa to visa he has a green card now it's, it's like his life has changed so this is like a life changing. He has three daughters. His life is just, he's a different human being right now. He plays music. He was in depression. Now he plays in music. So it's changing people's lives. So there are so many opportunities. These are the reasons why you should uh, 
um, you know, really talk to attorney. I mean, you know, I keep saying that, but people don't understand why we are. And believe me, it's not about the money. You know, um, we charge for consultation. I mean, um, you know, it probably hundred fifty dollars. And many people actually, I, I understand people right saying that's a lot of money. Yes, it is a lot of money for some countries, some places, but. Um, you know, that time is for you, not for me. It's for you to tell me, explain properly, and I can give you a better response, right? So, and through those conversa conversations, we get these, these uh, solutions, what we can do. Like he came to me, when he came to our office, he was like, can we explore another L1? My L1 is denied, but can we do another L1? And we explored, we said, no, we don't recommend because you don't have this. Then we had another consultation. He said, what about if I do E2? And we said, no, Brazil can do an E2. Then we said, oh, okay, what about? So we, we back and forth this consultation, but now he did something that he had zero hope that he would, would be able to do one day. So these are the, it's a work. I understand it's a money, but unfortunately, yes, there's a cost, but there's a return. So you have to really, if you are really dedicated, you want to do something, you invest in it. You know, there is no investment, there is no return. You, you asked me a question, but that's why I told you, it's very broad, right? We didn't even talk about EV1, green card through EV1, we didn't talk about green, green card through U1, green card through asylum, a lot of stuff we didn't talk. Yes, you can get asylum through, uh, I'm sorry, green card through asylum. Um, so when you are granted asylum, asylum is granted indefinitely. Basically means that you can stay on asylum for your entire life. You don't have to have to apply for green card. But whoever wants to be a permanent resident of the United States, they can apply um, one year after the grant of asylum, one year. And um, if you apply, um, you wait four years and you get your citizenship. So it's basically, there is no automatic green card, but you can apply and everyone can apply. And there is no reason why they would deny your green card application unless you have a criminal background. I don't know if your background check reveals something that you shouldn't be there. But it's it's a you know highway basically for everyone to get green card once you have asylum granted. I would say the difficult part is the is the asylum getting granted. Attorney Jafarov, thank you very much for your valuable time and thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on immigration processes here in the United States. I am sure that this content is going to be of a very high value to my international audience. I'd like to ask you for a personal recommendation that you can give out to my international audience in terms of consulting a professional when it comes to immigration processes. I, I really thank you. I, I believe we get a lot of good reception from people, which is a good thing. I mean, I think you have a great audience, but um, I really advise people. It's my personal advice. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm, I believe professional, I'm in that position to advise, but uh, personally, maybe I'm not, but I really want people to really focus on their lives to the results, not, not you know, um, how people say what they say, whatever. I mean, these are, these are really, if you want to be successful in life, really have to pursue your dream. You know, it's really still the, the country of dreams. Um, people achieve a lot of crazy stuff in this country. So um, you need to really focus on your ideas and move forward. Don't listen to anyone else. And, and a lot of good things are going to happen. We went through a very difficult four years. But, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. So right now we have a lot of change coming. Actually, I would love to make maybe short video about those changes, uh, if you could one day. Because, you know, believe me, every single day I, I have to call people and people call me 10 times, my existing clients even, you know, uh, can you tell us if those changes are going to affect me, impact me. So that's the problem area that we also need to talk one day, maybe briefly at least, just to give people, I, you know, some some um, idea what's going to happen and what to expect, what's not to expect. Thank you very much for everything. And I am really looking forward to our next interview and looking forward to answering some of the new frequently asked questions on this channel. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much and bye. Thanks so much. You have a great day.